This is Digital Music Transa, episode 139, on the 4th of July 2013. This week on the show, all about the Japanese music market, Foursquare teams up with Deezer, RIAA certifications, songs at Ghost Premium, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the week's news in the digital music industry. DMT is available on a variety of platforms as both audio and video, including iTunes, and most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Stitcher and more. And this week I'm really happy to welcome on the show uh, two great guests uh, from uh, two different continents, so we're kind of spread out uh, today. Uh, so joining me from LA, it's great to have Taishi Fukuyama back. Uh, Taishi is now Executive Director at Portal an agency specializing in porting international technology, entertainment, and new media companies into Japan and Asia. And you can find the site on enter.prtl.jp. So hi, Taishi, and great to have you on. How's it going? I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to have you. And also on the show, I'm really happy to welcome uh, Steve McClure from mcclurmusic.com. Uh, Steve specializes in the Japanese music market and he lives in Tokyo. And his site is a great way to stay up to date with uh, what's happening over there. So make sure you subscribe to his newsletter as well. So hi, Steve, and uh, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Not too bad, Andrew. Thank you very much for asking me to take part in the show. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys. It's great to have you. And uh, uh, so uh, this week uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, you know the worldwide news as usual, but we're also going to place a, a bit of a focus on j the Japanese music market because, of course, it makes a lot of sense with the guests that I have. And thanks so much, guys, for joining me as well because uh, I know that uh, it's a midnight in LA for Taishi and it's uh, I think it's 4 p.m. Uh, for Steve in Tokyo and it's 8 a.m. for me here in London. So it's uh, we're definitely spread out today. So hopefully the video will hold up for the entirety of the conversation. And uh, so I wanted to start with the international news, uh, uh, talking about location services. As Foursquare this week announced an interesting partnership with Deezer in 15 territories, including Brazil, Mexico, UK, Ireland, Indonesia, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Spain, Italy, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, and Poland. As part uh, of the partnership, users will be able to access uh, the uh, the Deezer uh, Premium Plus uh, account, which uh, offers uh, e mobile access and uh, offline caching and all of that for streaming, uh, if they check into seven different music venues in the territories that are included in the promotion. So it's quite an interesting promotion because it allows uh, users that perhaps, uh, there are definitely music fans, because of course they're checking into loads of venues, uh, to experience a streaming service if they haven't done so before, and it gives uh, Deezer that much more exposure for for uh, for the, uh, their service because of course in some of these territories there are multiple uh, uh services uh, for streaming and uh, you know these are can wouldn't be uh, for some people the obvious choice uh, in that sense and so uh the movie is interesting for both companies i think they both have something to gain from it uh, and uh, location services streaming services and uh, and and all of that is an equation that uh, could work well as a partnership so uh, you know, what, what do you guys think about it, it Taishi? From from your perspective, do you think that uh, you know Foursquare is big enough to grant Deezer uh, a decent chunk of new users? Uh, and on the other side, do you think users are interested in in this sort of uh, promotion as well? Well, it definitely sounds like a win-win because a lot of music venues are trying to do the offline to online thing in yeah. in you know some way, and if Foursquare, Foursquare in, um, enables them to do that. It seems like a good um, way for them to try that. Yeah. In in respect to like how to trying to envision that in a Japanese sense, um, you know, although Japan's not on that list, and neither Deezer is not even uh, hasn't launched in Japan. Yeah. But um, I think not a lot of Japanese music fans even check in. I mean, go to seven separate music venues. Period in Japan, a lot yeah. of like live music is associated to maybe like either jazz clubs, high end, or like summer festivals or which, you know, Steve is, has recently written about. And um, I think it would make sense in Europe where, you know, we have a lot of more smaller venues, U.S., a lot of smaller venues, and not so much in the in Japan, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And Steve, uh, did you find that the uh, Foursquare is used in Japan? I was just wondering, because uh, I know that here it's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm, you know, my friends are on Foursquare because, you know, it's a lot of people from the technology sector, but even in the U.K., I don't think it's that widely used, really. I confess total ignorance, um, to be quite honest, of Foursquare. If Deezer I know about, um, and I would just say that um, Deezer, 
from what I hear anecdotally from my uh, friends and contacts in the music business around the world, uh, has a bit of a, I mean, this probably isn't news to you guys, a uh, catch-up uh, thing happening vis-a-vis -vis gaining brand recognition. It seems that everybody knows who Spotify is. Uh, it may be an English, uh, you know, an Anglophone uh, thing. I don't know. Deezer seems to be making inroads in other parts of the world. So it really has to catch up, as I say, to uh, get the brand recognition um, that Spotify has. I can see this sort of deal, from what I understand of it, being a useful way of doing that in at least you know, making people aware that they're a player. Um, I, I'm a little uh, more optimistic than Taishi-san would be about the Japanese market because um, the live music market here in Japan has all sorts of venues. Um, you know, there are the big festivals, as you say, Taishi, but there are a lot of, um, you know, mid mid-sized concert halls. I'm thinking of Nakano Sun Plaza and, yes. you know, Shibuya Kokaido, places like that. Um, I would think the way to make that kind of thing work here, and I agree it is sort of a win-win deal from the sound of it, would be to hook up with the all-powerful production artist management companies and get into that, you know, very Japanese uh, music business ecosystem, yeah. um, you know, because, you know, people in Japan are like people everywhere else, and uh, they want to establish that sort of uh, quasi-organic connection uh, with the acts, and that's really, really important in today's uh, music business. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and I think Foursquare, Foursquare as well has a, uh, make, is making a good shift to, to go from uh, very localized promotions that are to do with the actual venues where you check into, uh, to doing more, more broad promotions uh, that take into account entire categories and then apply a potential deal to the entire category, whether it's a cafe or music venues or restaurants. And, and I think that would encourage people to really use the service a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. rather than just use it to get a very specific deal if they become mayor of a certain cafe or if they check in four times in a very specific place. Uh, right. So that could be interesting. But yeah, again, Foursquare it seems like a service that is, is kept on track, but I don't think they've increased their user base all that much in the last maybe a couple of years. Uh, I might be wrong, but it just doesn't feel like there's this, this huge adoption happening with Foursquare. Uh, also because you know other location services are cropping up like uh, Facebook places that are uh, kind of eating its lunch a little bit. So even if Foursquare is a, a better service overall. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see if they get to other types of uh, promotions. Like for example, uh, I could envisage something like for, for with a, um, an open table partnership in the US, for example, uh, where you, you'd get a discount at a restaurant if you checked into like 10 restaurants in a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but very interesting stuff. And uh, uh, from the I wanted to move into talking about uh, the Japanese music market for a little bit because uh, uh, there's been a, a few bits of news coming out of uh, Japan in the last uh, couple of months uh, and uh, I wanted to turn my attention to uh, first of all uh, reports that uh, the Japanese music market is on the brink of overtaking the US in terms of revenues oh. which is a huge story of course because you know we all know how big uh, the Japanese music market is but uh, uh, I think a few of us uh, were aware of how big it was, uh, and uh, uh, there's only a 1.2 uh, difference between uh, Japan's music sales and uh, the US music sales in 2012, as reported by the IFPI, and uh, the two countries account for more than half of the entire recorded industry in the world. Uh, so uh, this, coupled with the continued r rise in physical in Japan, especially last year, uh, could mean that Japan will overtake the US in 2013, especially as uh, uh, I just read a, a report from Musicale that came out uh, literally five minutes ago talking about the fact that uh, digital, digital track sales in the US are, uh, have declined in the first quarter by 2% uh, or something around those lines. Uh, and so what do you guys think about this? And did you expect this even just like two or three years ago that this could be a potential outcome? Uh, Steven? Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm. You know, it's it's surprising um, to me uh, for historical reasons because, yeah. I mean, I have been covering the Japanese music industry since 1991 when I started writing for Billboard, and you know, you just always assume you know U.S. number one. It's kind of like I didn't realize until recently how much that had been etched into my brain when this story came out. That you know, in fact, some um, uh, media actually reported that Japan is number one. They interpreted the IFPI figures probably 
<clears throat> on the basis of uh, exchange rate conversion or factoring in performance, uh, royalties, whatnot, that, you know, that they said that uh, the U.S. had been overtaken already. But uh, if you look at the IFPI data, as you say, um, the U.S. is still in number one you know, position, but just marginally. So, yeah. I mean, obviously that reflects the, <clears throat> the uh, huge decline in the physical recorded music market in the U.S. And I think we got to rem remind people here that we are talking about the recorded music market. That sounds like an old-fashioned term, but the overall music market, of course, includes concerts and synchronization and karaoke fees and all the, you know, uh, copyright fees that come from other revenue streams besides yeah. uh, the recorded music market. So, um, yeah, and it also reflects the resilience of the Japanese physical market, which is resilient for some very, very, uh, I hate to use the term, culture-specific ways. And Taishi's going to know what I'm talking about. You too, probably, Andrea. We're talking about AKB48, the whole idol phenomenon, which I have very mixed feelings about um, <laughs> culturally, sociologically, but also business-wise, because, you know, how long can an idol phenomenon last? And that is propelling, keeping the, the physical market um, you know, going, but uh, I forget what's the statistic for, um, for the top 100 albums or singles, probably both um, in Japan last year, and like 75% of them, this is a ballpark uh, recollection on my part, were accounted for by idol acts. And that's, you know, there are always going to be idol acts in Japan, but that's probably a higher percentage than in recent years. And then the other thing in this equation, and I could go on and on about this, so just cut me oh, off. Sorry, no, yeah. Uh, yeah, is um, <clears throat> you have a f digital music market here, which is in a weird state of transition. It grew early, right, because of uh, master ringtones and uh, full song downloads by, via what are now called feature phones. But the whole feature phone uh, digital market is, is dying. Um, that's because feature phones are, you know, going out of style, and smartphones haven't yet taken up all the slack. Um, and that's the big question, I guess, really, to me here in the market, uh, in the Japanese market. You know, will that transition um, be effective? Will smartphones, you know, take up the slack, and not just take up the slack, but you know, become an engine of growth for the digital music market? That's got to happen. Yeah. Um, but people in Japan have been slower to take up smartphones than in other markets. Um, so that's that's just a very, very cursory, uh, sketchy outline of the situation. Sure. So it, my, my, my conclusion is, uh, yeah, Japan could, could take over from the U.S. as the world's number one music market. But, you know, despite the resiliency and some of the, <clears throat> of the f physical music market here and the prospect for growth, that isn't, you know, that reflects um, as much, if not more, the U.S.'s decline as opposed right. to japan's health I, you know that's that's the kind of sobering aspect of it right yeah absolutely and uh, to tell you, uh steve, steve made a good point in that uh the growth of the japanese market is very much tied to the physical market and a very specific right. uh, j-pop phenomenon uh which uh, you know you never know with these phenomena they could end really at any point uh, and yes. uh, and that because that is not coupled with the growth of a sustainable digital market yet uh, mm -hmm. that puts the Japanese music industry in uh, perhaps a more dangerous place than the US music industry where the shift to digital has already happened and and you know we can't really see that declining that much at this point because uh, you know uh, adoption is still happening and things are, are are looking up on that front especially on the streaming side and so right. uh, and, and Steve was mentioning feature phones and of course we have to remember that the feature phones in Japan were very different from the feature phones that we think of in in Europe because I remember being in Tokyo maybe like two two years ago and the feature phones are very they were very complete feature phones that had internet access that had music downloads right. and all sorts of stuff they're very within sophisticated them. yeah yeah very advanced uh, feature phones and and that's why people like a few years ago used to talk about Japan as uh, as, as this incredible place where everybody has you know a uh, Really, really intelligent phones that can do all sorts of stuff uh, and th the problem is that the transition into smartphones was not sustained by the presence of uh, a ready market for digital services that people could get access to easily uh, because mm -hmm. that's still, still still being developed is, is that is that the case uh, and there was an interesting article also on evolver.fm by alan swartz who's a former dj and executive of, of, of mtv who's also talking about 
problems with the catalog licensing as well. So like Sony Music uh, Unlimited, uh, the one of the few streaming services in Japan, is missing uh, the catalog of a really big label uh, called uh, uh, Avex. Uh, Avex. Avex. Avex, because they have their own digital service, but their, their own digital service uh, lacks the Sony Music Japan catalog, which is a huge catalog as well. So uh, ha, uh, Taishi, how do you see this evolving? And do you think mm -hmm. uh, there, there are services out there that are going to be able to aggregate the whole Japanese music catalog and be able to offer a compelling okay. service out there? Well, I think um, kind of speaking on top of what Steve laid down uh, right there, Japan right now has like several digital music services, including iTunes, and they all have fragmented catalogs. And what happens is that Japan being like one culture, one language, one time zone, and one nationality country pretty much, the, the chart is very, very powerful. So when you see like uh, a CD chart with all these idols in there, and then you go to an iTunes and you can't find their songs or something, you know, like the adoption for these services doesn't really grow. And I think that's one of the factors of these digital services that are struggling to really do well in Japan. Yeah. And the reason why, you know, like CDs are doing so well um, is has a big like the culture aspect definitely has a big influence on it and also maybe like Japan also has this business model where you can rent CDs still and it's pretty much like three five dollars to rent a, rent an album whereas you know if you go to iTunes you have to pay fifteen dollars or so yeah so everybody you know just goes and rents their favorite album after they listen to it on iTunes and decide that it's a rent worthy CD and um, and obviously iTunes has a very different market presence than compared to other places where they are. Yeah. yeah so, sure. I mean, going back to your initial question about like, is it, was it surprising to see, um, you know, Japan's shift and how it's, you know, like comparing to us in terms of just recorded music? Um, Maybe not so much as Steve, because like obviously we're talking just about recorded, I guess. Um, the whole industry as a whole, um, I, the Japan, like, like we're all discussing, like the digital side has a lot of flaws, and when we see Jap Japanese services um, pick that up using smartphones in better ways, yeah. um, I don't know. And at least we're seeing like non music industry players like get into this service um, space where. Um, like internet companies are going in there making like internet radio streaming services. Yeah. And that's a good sign because they have no affinity and maybe they'll search things up. And obviously the international players were, are, try, are eyeball, eyeballing Japan, trying to get into um, Japanese content, Japanese licenses and launching. So yeah. I think um, it's, a, it's just the, the dawn of digital services in Japan all yeah. over again. And can I ask you also, um, uh, from a more uh, sort of a technical insider standpoint what was who was providing the downloads for the tracks that were being downloaded uh, through the the so-called feature phones in japan which were those like really long phones that were super uh, popular until like a couple of years ago and uh, uh, was that one service or server provider or t a telephone provider because i know that the downloads are quite expensive were about four dollars per track uh, and was that aggregating a bigger catalog than what current digital services are at the moment and, and who was that licensed uh, from essentially uh well i think there were the two big business models were the downloading side and also the subscription side yeah so um the subscription meaning more like a like a feature phone based fan club where artists had um, that was a big business uh, separately from the download side. Right. Uh, on the downloading, you had a Japanese digital service called Rekochoku, which is uh, the, that powered, that enabled uh, users to get music content yeah. onto their phones. And the fan club side was more managed by the artist management companies where they would do like exclusive photos or like maybe like a blog of the artist where if you subscribe and pay three, four hundred yen yeah. monthly, which is, you know, carrier bill, then you pretty much set and forget. And, you know, big artists had really big businesses built on this business model. That's really interesting, actually, because uh, I don't know if you guys read, there was a post by uh, Mark Mulligan that attracted some uh, commentary and the people were sort of wondering whether that's, that's you know, the, the way the industry is going to go. But he was talking yeah. about how important 
uh, perhaps one or two pound subscriptions to specific mm -hmm. artists uh, channels also perhaps via uh, subscription services as an add-on uh, could perhaps be uh, an interesting alternative way of increasing the size of the pie for the music industry and uh, uh, Stephen do you think that's something that is likely to happen and also I wanted to get your opinion on uh, how come uh, that you know a download service like like the one Taishi mentioned that had uh, such a stronghold on the future for market didn't think about migrating itself onto onto the smartphone world before that drop-off happened like we've seen in the last 12 months or so? Well, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is Reko Choku is owned by major Japanese labels. So it's, and it basically right. acts as a, a cartel. Uh, and there are a lot of, you know, I hesitate to say it, but I will say it, restrictive, um, counterintuitive, you know, market unfriendly practices by a lot of uh, Japanese music companies because um, and again, it sounds paranoid, but as is pointed out in that uh, piece that you mentioned um, on Evolver FM by Alan Swartz, um, Japanese labels are, and music companies in general uh, are pretty, uh, suspicious is perhaps too strong a word, but um, they're wary of the digital market because it means less control yeah. for them because it's not physical, right? Um, and so it is, fra you know, he's got a quote here, the bottom line is there's no digital service in Japan that is so complete that makes it consumers, that, that it makes consumers think they can abandon CDs and go entirely digital. And that's probably how the industry likes it. I agree. I think that's right. So mm. um, now why Reko Choku? Um, you know, it's it's gone over. It's going over to smartphone, from what I understand. Um, there are smartphone is seen as sort of iTunes territory, I guess. Um, yeah. That's that's one thing. Um, they they have to make that transition. Um, I think you know maybe they're just being sticks in the mud as much as anything else. Um, if if they want to um, survive in this new era, um, so. You know that that may be just conservatism or you know bureaucracy inertia on their part. But now I think the statistic is like fifty percent of Japanese, um, yeah, fifty percent of Japanese mobile phone users now have smartphones. It's gone way up in the, just the past six months. And, and just as a footnote here, that may make it uh, easier for foreign repertoire holders to sell their product digitally in Japan. It's just a function of the physical nature of the screens. You know, it's just really hard to get a lot of information on those dinky little feature phone screens. Yeah. Um, with uh, smartphones, you have a nice, I mean, especially as we're going into, you know, there's a gray area between tablet and um, smartphone, as we now mm -hmm. see. It just makes it a lot easier to put menus up and um, to broaden the appeal of foreign music. So, um, I, I hope that the, uh, you know, and there are other aggregators around um, that are, I can think of one in um, Tokyo that's owned by a, a German colleague of mine who are very optimistic about the smartphone market for the reasons I just described. Um, the other interesting thing in this, just to sort of randomly address some of the points here, oh, um, you, yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, players, uh, the streaming players coming into the market. Um, and I, along with some other people, rashly predicted that Spotify and RDO and Deezer would be launching in Japan this year. Certainly they've set up, I don't know about Deezer, but the other two, yeah, they have representation here. Um, and I, you know, I'm expecting them, to, expecting them to do something this year, but, you know, as Taishi and yourself and other people have suggested, um, it's all down to licensing and getting people to play ball. Yeah. And, you know, Avex and Sony, um, you know, it's interesting. They're both domestically owned companies uh, as opposed to, you know, I don't want to say they're the bad guys, but they're more protective yeah. um, of their repertoire. And the other thing in this whole crazy ecosystem is the production companies, the management companies, uh, like the Johnny's, you know, uh, stable of uh, male idol acts and the people, you know, uh, behind AKB48, Akimoto. They are in love with the physical um, music business, right? Because they can sell all this stuff yeah. to their really, really loyal, diehard fans. So digital doesn't have much of an appeal for them. So they're they're wary of licensing their stuff yeah. um, to the digital services. And another thing, another wacky thing in this whole scenario is, as Mr. Swartz points out 
in his blog, physical product in Japan is still um, subject to what is known in Japanese as Saihan Seido, the fee- <clears throat> fixed price uh, maintenance system. Yeah, means that manufacturers can control, regulate, and you know set the price of their goods. That doesn't apply to the digital sector, as far as I recall. So um, that's probably one structural reason why rights holders in Japan aren't going falling over themselves yeah. to embrace digital. I think, it's, and and Taishi, re, uh, you know, mentioned the record rental biz, and that's unique to Japan. And that's a, yeah, the number of records, uh, record rental stores has fallen, but there's a mm-hmm. certain degree of corporate concentration yeah. that's behind that. And uh, it's a major, major factor here. It explains a lot of peculiarities, if you will, Absolutely. in the Japanese music business. And you were talking about that, that, um, the law essentially, and and what it does, it it prevents essentially just to just to explain it uh, mm. clearly, it prevents uh, retailers from uh, heavily discounting uh, goods like CDs, books, uh, uh, or DVDs in order to get people through the doors, like it happens all the time in Europe and in the US. So essentially, if it's, if a CD price is priced as twenty three dollars or twenty dollars, it will stay at twenty dollars no matter what. You, you can't really place a huge amount of discount on that. So yeah, it's it's weakened in the last 10, 15 years um, because it is, you know, it's a restrictive trade practice if you want to look at it yeah. that way. Um, you know, there's another side of it which is, you know, as the Recording Industry Association here says, well, it helps keep music culture alive. It helps keep record companies alive too. Um, and you know, there's a lot to be said for that. I don't want to be dismissive, um, but. There's a time period. There's a limit, right, um, involved, and I, I guess it used to be basically forever. You know, they set the prices forever, and in recent years, it's eroded, and there's more flexibility on the part of the record labels, uh, rights holders. Probably one reason for that is that Japan has been in a you know deflationary uh, economic situation for the past 20 years. So there's a lot of downward you know pressure on all prices. Not just uh, copyright goods like CDs. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Taishi, um, mm-hmm. Steve wrote an interesting article uh, a couple of weeks back about uh, this new uh, sort of uh, Western or at least you know international facing English speaking uh, website uh, launched by Promic, which is a foundation for promotion of in music industry and culture uh, on Promic.tv, which promotes <laughs> Japanese music and pop culture internationally. So uh, the English language site features Japanese pop music videos, cultural commentary, it's got a, a, a national program titled J-Pop News. And, and so essentially, you know, it places a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on exporting uh, both the music and also the pop culture of Japan internationally. So I wanted to ask you, how do you see that uh, happening? And do you feel like there is the potential for uh, J-pop to have a breakout artist uh, like Korean pop had in, 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 in Psy, for example? Uh, and is there a lot of emphasis from the acts themselves to, in a way, Western, no, westernize themselves? Because, of course, we all know that the only reason why Psy really became a huge phenomenon worldwide was because he adopted a lot of the uh, practices and, and you know the way that you know the video was shot and, and the song was structured it was uh, right. very much uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, suitable to a European and American sort of uh, cultural uh, cultural practice so so how, how do you feel about that do you feel like uh, Japanese artists are going the same way in, in some sense I think um, most concerning still the the sheer market size of the Japanese music industry um, if you're pretty much signed to a major label, you're going to be marketed towards that, towards that crowd, towards those fans, yeah. and your music is going to tend to be very more Japanese-oriented. <laughs> now, considering all the tools and, and social media, digital tools, like the distribution channels that are available to anybody right now, I think it would be smart for a lot of independent artists to kind of realize that if they start making music that's catered more to an international taste, uh, they have they can pretty much have put the power in their hands to you know make a couple bucks in different countries. Now, will the record labels themselves start doing that? I'm not sure, but. At least we're seeing, you know, Promic and, for example, like Sync Music Japan and Barks, you know, launching English versions of their websites and trying to promote culture outside. Yeah. Now, the reason why I think they're doing this is because although, you know, physical is, seems like 
um, on chart to be growing, it is like we like we've discussed just b- between a couple like uh, idle based phenomenons. Yeah. Does this does this mean like everyone's CDs sales are growing? Not at all. So like in order to really grow and you know develop new artists, they're going to have to either make the international crowd fall in love with Japanese music or start making international <coughs> taste ish music i think yeah right uh, uh, the, the stuff that we're making right now in japan does not do that so i think that's why we're we're you know promoting japanese music into like Jap- japan expos and like um anime uh anime cons and you know stuff like this yeah can we get into bonnaroo and stuff like that not not for a while yeah <laughs> exactly uh, steven do you agree with taish on that well um i have a uh, yeah i i think um there's a you know, an imperative, I think, as, as Taishi points out, for uh, independent Japanese acts, especially, um, who have a tough time, you know, getting into the ecosystem here um, to, you know, promote their music overseas. And I'm very much in favor of that. I'm a big believer uh, in the uh, strength and depth and width, whatever you want to call it, of the Japanese music scene. There's just so much great music here. And um, a lot of people both in Japan and overseas, don't appreciate that or can't f- see that too clearly because of the dominance of the idol acts. And, <clears throat> you know, the obvious comparison here is K-pop and the extraordinarily good job uh, Korean acts and their managements have management companies have done in promoting them overseas. And so people in Japan say, well, gee, why can't we be like that? And really, you know, there's no reason they can't. But there are structural differences between the Japanese and Korean music industries um, that are worth noting in this regard. And I'll just be very brief and point out that, you know, the Korean music market is a lot smaller than Japan's. Um, The other thing is the music ecosystem, the revenue stream is really, really different. Um, Physical died in Korea some 10, 15 years ago because of all the online file sharing. Korea went crazy with broadband. Um, Everything became digital. And most of that was illegal or unauthorized. The telcos, the the telecommunications companies got into the act, set up a system whereby you know, they sold music. The market was legitimized to a large extent, but the telcos take the lion's share of the revenue stream. It means the artists and the management companies uh, can't make much money domestically in a you know relatively small market. So there's this structural imperative for them to export overseas. The Korean government got behind them in a big way. Uh, not just the Korean government, but you know the whole sort of. Uh, corporate infrastructure um, got behind K-pop. They saw it quite correctly as a uh, a good way to spread, you know, a cool image of Korea overseas and make some money. That, n- those factors are very, very different in Japan because Japan. Oh, forgive the lecture here, but I always compare it to. Uh, American car makers in the 50s and 60s, the music market here, and that sounds like a weird comparison maybe, but um, they've got a huge captive domestic market, and the Americans kept producing these big, junky cars for a long time until they had the crap kicked out of them by the Germans and the Japanese who came along with these cool, smaller cars that were more economical and actually better. And the analogy kind of breaks down because, you know, the music is more culture-specific, right? So, but... The point is, so Japan can keep selling this stuff um, internally, um, and there's not a huge impetus for Japanese companies to export. They should, I think, for the long-term health of the industry, because, as we've discussed, a lot of the stuff that sells here is idol-oriented. Who buys our, well, I don't know, that's a scary question. Who buys AKB48? A lot of middle-aged guys, apparently. (laughs) But, but, um, you know... A, a lot of this idol stuff is aimed at younger people, and that's yeah. a really s- shrinking demographic here. You know, it's a graying mm. society. Look, look at me. Um, but, uh, you know, if the Japanese music industry wants to survive long term and make its stuff more marketable overseas, they're going to have to uh, develop some different kinds of acts. And uh, Taishi's point about Psy is really well uh, taken because... You know, there's like him, like Girls Generation and Kara and all these people. They've adapted their music for consumption outside of Korea. It's still kind of idolish, right? Um, I'm a bit skeptical of these sort of top-down initiatives by people like Promic 
uh, to promote m- Japanese music, music overseas, all power to them. But it, it as I say, is it's very much top down, and it needs, I mean, it needs more sort of industry. And I say not just in music industry, but like you know, Japanese corporate uh, backing and and more sort of yeah, more grassroots stuff too. Um, it would be good uh, for the overall industry if yeah. that happened. But uh, you know, everyone asks me, gee. When are we going to see another sukiyaki, right? You know, mm. Ue Omuite Aruko, uh, which is the only Japanese song to ever hit number one in Billboard way back in 1963. And I, <laughs> I say, I always say, gee, you know, come up with another great novelty tune, and which, <laughs> and which, which is what, you know, Sai, Sai did, you know, with Gangnam Style. That's a novelty tune. But, you know, these are one offs by definition. Yeah. I want to see, I want to see. Some of my favorite Japanese artists like Shino Dingo and the Great Three and uh, oh, lots of others really connect with overseas audiences. And it's just somebody's got to do it in a, in a really good organic way. I hope so. Yeah, and who knows? Like, I mean, uh, uh, to to the point that you were talking about the fact that you know the the streaming services are talking about licensing with uh, some of the Japanese labels at the moment. Uh, that's another point where you know if if they could get a deal done. Uh, for Japan, that could affect not only the Japanese market as far as having those services available and with a complete catalog is, uh, catalog is concerned, but also affect the discoverability of those artists outside of Japan, uh, whereby at the moment you know people don't really have access to that music unless they go perhaps on YouTube and search for very specific artists. Right. Uh, if they you know if they start listening to maybe a couple and then they keep getting more recommendations through the Spotify Discover or or Ardio's own discovery f- uh, functionalities, then th- they maybe be able to explore more of the Japanese catalog if it's licensed to those services than they would otherwise uh, ever be able to do. So that's a really right. interesting uh, thing to look at as well. And and finally, I just wanted to uh, f- end this overview by talking about uh, another big sort of elephant in the room when it comes to uh, uh, the music industry. We talked about uh, you know labels, uh, the uh, all powerful management companies and production companies, uh, the support of 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 industry, but uh, the Japanese Author Society is also like a huge uh, part of the music industry in Japan. You know they announced uh, an increase of the co- fees collections of by 5.6 percent to uh, 1.14 billion, which is a huge amount of money uh, because it includes you know all the fees that are collected for karaoke boxes and uh, all sorts of different. Uh, that's uh, that's places. dollars. Remember that's dollars. Then. Andrew, dollars, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, okay. 111 billion yen. Yeah, exactly. The, you're absolutely right to point that out. And mm-hmm. uh, and so that's that's a huge amount of money. It's like it's it's it's, it's in, in the performance rights fees were up five percent to uh, 54.2 billion yen, which is 571.2 million dollars. So really big numbers. And I just wanted to ask you like a more uh, generic questions. I know in different countries people have different perceptions of their collection societies, and you know we all know about the you know, the PR issues of Gamer in Germany, for example, and PRS for Music have got their own uh, image out there, and, you know, ASCAP and, and BMI also have their own uh, image uh, in the US. What is the perception of uh, uh, Just Rock in Japan? Is it perceived as a, uh, a positive organization? Does it create issues in terms of licensing? Does it ever block deals or anything like that, uh, Taishi? Um, as far as I know, there... They're archaic, but they're very diligent and yeah. to collect. <laughs> so, and I and they really don't have that many like variety of. Uh, it's it's very straightforward as far as I know. If you're in digital and need to pay Jasrak, it's you know a pretty much a straight fee. Right. And I think getting you know content licensed and all that is 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 far more complex and and. Uh, that's the 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 huge elephant in the room, in the room more yeah. than probably like the collection part of it. Yeah, that's interesting because you know, of course, you want to know that in in different countries, it's a, it can be a different story, and it can be actually the collection society that uh, can put roadblocks on the on the on the licensing issues, like like we've seen happening in Germany. Uh, Stephen, what were your thoughts on on just Rack just qu- quickly, and uh, a- any positive or negative thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, I totally agree with Taishi saying it's diligent but archaic, or archaic but diligent. That really sums it up really well. Um, they're kind of friendly, heavy old bureaucracy, and you know, uh, they got into a little controversy um, a few years ago when 
uh, e-license, which uh, I bet Taishi knows about, which is um, <clears throat> a private company operating, you know, as a fee collection agency. Um, you know, that was uh, possible after the law um, that had given uh, Jazrak a monopoly was repealed a few years ago. And e-license basically filed a complaint with the Fair Trade Commission, the government's Fair Trade Commission here, saying that uh, Jazrak had a stranglehold on broadcast fee collections under its blanket uh, fee collection system and that this was restrictive, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think e-license didn't win on that one. That's a, that's a tough one because, you know, yeah, Jazrak does have such weight. It has so many people behind it that it's hard to dislodge it uh, from its, you know, it's a one-stop convenient thing for, um, you know, authors, right? So, um, stodgy, but still kind of aggressive. Um, they're, um, you know, trying to expand their fee collection, um, you know, net, as it were, cast a wider net. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at my own story here. Um, yeah, they, um, you know, they're making deals with people who post uh, lyrics on blogs, stuff like this. They're trying to reach out um, through their own, I think it's on YouTube uh, channel, right, educating people. They do a lot of educational work. Um, they, you know, they're unique. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think there are too many other uh, societies like them in that they do both mechanical and for performance fee right. collections. So, so they're huge, right? They're sitting on a lot of money. Um, so yeah, diligent is, is a good word to describe them. Yeah. I would prefer to see the e-licenses and the other, you know, competitors uh, stir right. things up a bit, um, maybe with technological advances that enable, um, you know, tracks that are broadcast to be individually tracked yeah. and, uh, tr you know, traced that will be a re result in a more transparent, uh, revenue stream. But uh, wouldn't we all, I think it's, uh, it's, I, I guess it's on, on many people in many countries would like their societies to, to do a more track by track tracking, but yeah. it's not happening oh, I, yet. The, yeah, the Jazzrack show, I'm just looking at my, I should read what I write. Um, the Jazzrack <laughs> show, what a great name, is on the Nico Nico Live website. It's not on YouTube, but All right. uh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, that's great. And uh, I think it was a great overview. Thanks, guys, for that. Uh, I just wanted to cover a couple more international stories uh, in the last 10 minutes before we close. And, uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, going back, uh, today's the 4th of July. Uh, and uh, I think everywhere now, because uh, Taishi, it's, uh, you're in LA, so happy 4th of July for you as well. Uh, it's uh, just uh, midnight 46, what you're thinking about at this point. Yes, it is. And so, and so you, if you have a Samsung device and uh, you have a Google Play oh, Store right. account, you could be able to to uh, go and get the uh, Jay-Z album Magna Carta uh, Holy Grail from uh, right now. And I've seen a few people already tweet that they've uh, gone and got it. So I would love mm -hmm. to hear about their experience as well of how that worked out with the, with the app and everything. But um, there was an interesting uh, a twist in the Jay-Z and Samsung giveaway saga this week as the RIAA is taking a very different stance from uh, Nielsen and Billboard on how to account for the 1 million copies that were purchased by the electronics giant Samsung uh, for the free giveaway to its customers. So uh, the RIAA is uh, Liz Kennedy, who is the Director of Communications and Gold and Platinum Programs, uh, posted uh, on the organization's blog uh, the fact that they decided to alter the certification rules after looking at their records uh, to ensure that album sales that were made digitally become eligible for gold and platinum status from the moment of release. And this essentially goes to cancel the 30 days window for certification that was only a heritage from the physical world and in fact still applies there because it, it needs to say, that, you know, that, that they use that to take into account returns that uh, often happen with physical physical records. So I, I, I'm all for the change because it makes sense, you know, in the digital space there, there aren't many returns at all. Uh, on the other side, this is interesting because it, it acknowledges that the one million copies that were sold to Samsung uh, are going to be counted by the RIAA for certification. Uh, and this is a different stance from, from Nielsen Soundscan and Billboard, uh, uh, who will not count those sales towards the chart as they, you know, the classic as, as being a promotional activity, since none of the copies are actually being purchased by the end user. They're, they're, they're downloaded for free. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, how, how do you feel about this disparity? Of course, it makes sense for the industry organization to be uh, encouraging this sort of deals and uh, counting them towards certification, uh, but it does raise questions as to whether, you know, I'm certainly uh, agreeing with uh, 
Bill, Bill Ward's uh, uh, editorial on Billboard uh, talking about why they didn't count those copies in the charts, and I don't think they should count for the charts. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, w w what's your take, uh, Teishi? Mm. Well, I mean, I, first of all, I think it's you got to kind of give props to Jay Z for doing something as bold as this. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and that he kind of just said, you know, who cares about those charts anyway, right? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it, right? That's the, and I think the the chart system, as powerful as it is, but it's old, right? Yeah. And and having an artist like um, make that chart relevant again by 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 these means is a very important way of renewing how things are being charted and counted. So. I gotta say, I th I think it it was. I'm not sure if it was the right way for things to get renewed for charting, but uh, it's in inevitable. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I hope it's something like this could happen in Japan, actually. Yeah. And like and like and honestly, I think when you see like brands buying like bulk buying content and then just distributing them, and I like, at what point are they gonna just wake up and say, well, we can just start making records? You know, we can just say, here's your advance, let's make a record together, and they're just going to become a publisher and then a record label, in, in essence, yeah. I think. Yeah, because it would make sense in the sense that, you know, of course, that then you would count out the middleman, which is a record label, and if you're an artist big enough to be able to take the entire cut of what the brand is going to pay you, then maybe that makes sense. Although, you know, the, the labels are still all-powerful when it comes to international marketing, which is still a pretty important uh, Part of the distribution process, right. uh, Stephen. Do you, do you feel like this is uh, something that uh, could happen in Japan, as far as brand partnerships are concerned? I know that you guys have mega idol acts as well that would work well with brands and probably do work well with brands. Uh, but in terms of content giveaways, uh, how do you feel about this whole scenario? I have mixed feelings because a, I mean, I think it's great that people find means to get their music to people. That's the the yeah. basic thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. But b, it in some sense, and this is kind of an old way of looking at it perhaps, but it does, at least to my ancient mind, sort of devalue the value of the music, make it a lost leader, if you will. But there's always been that kind of thing happening uh, with music. You know, there's always been, you know, there have been budget LPs and giveaways at Walmart and places like that. Um, again, so the main thing is artists um, and, you know, people who make music, getting their music out to the people. Uh, and, and, you know, the question of charts just to go to that you know look at that for a moment i'm a former billboard person i was never i never had anything to do with the charts right that wasn't yeah. you know i reported on the japanese music business why do charts exist they provide the two reasons really they promote music to people because people have this interest people we're human beings we go oh, like who's number one who's number two and we're very competitive and kind of tribal that way and it also is true that charts provide a useful hopefully neutral benchmark for the people in the inter in the industry you know to look at and say oh yeah we're doing so uh, we got this guy in a number one he's slipping blah 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 yeah. so so for on, based on the first criterion i can see the logic of you know the riaa saying hey you know who cares how this um, record was distributed to people it reached them you know this is the chart should reflect the popularity of the release not necessarily how it became popular but um from billboard's point of view you know they want to they want a level playing field in terms of the charts you know yeah. they're obsessed with methodology so they're kind of in a tough place um sure. you know and yeah so i i would you know jay-z's album is popular because people like it that's what it comes down to or they like the product it's associated with it becomes complicated but to your, over to your question about Japan, you know, when, when you said, oh, yeah, maybe um, suggest the idea of people, brands, you know, distributing artists or sponsoring artists, I started to think of Japanese baseball. Uh, now, uh, maybe Taishi will laugh at this. Um, I hope you do. Um, because, <laughs> you know, in Japan, brands like, you know, Seibu is a big real estate developer, um, railway company, department store owner, they have a baseball team. All baseball teams in Japan are not run as separate businesses. They're run as PR operations. 
by big companies, right? So maybe that's what's going to happen to recording artists in Japan. We'll have the, you know, the Seibu AK, AKB48 or something. It's not inconceivable. Yeah. But, you know, mm-hmm. but to, take it, to take AKB48, it is a brand. Yeah. It's, it's not really, I don't think of AKB48 as a musical group. It's a marketing phenomenon. So, you know, and Akimoto, the guy behind AKB48, AKB48 is a genius because he's used music as a way to, you know, make this product, this image, whatever you want to call it, ubiquitous in Japanese society. Um, so I could, back to Andrea's question, I can see that sort of brand loyal or brand branding, um, you know, use of, how should I say it, of pop acts by brands uh, catching on in Japan. Uh, yeah. It just would take somebody with some kind of entrepreneurial vision uh, to do that, like a Horie kind of guy. You yeah. see him doing that, right? You know? mm, absolutely. Well, very interesting. And uh, uh, the uh, other, one of the other stories that was uh, floating around this week is uh, the fact that uh, internet radio service Songza uh, finally announced the launch of its paid tier to complement the advertising-funded one. Uh, we kept seeing a scaling of the service. They kept announcing a growth in numbers, and you know they, they now have over six million people downloading its latest mobile application in the U.S. and Canada, which are the only two territories where the service is available. And you know the company in a blog post claimed to deliver over half a billion songs per month to its users. And of course, all this leads to increased licensing costs and uh, in order to compensate for this uh, Songza is uh, now uh, opting to offer a weekly subscription of uh, 99 cents per week uh, called Club Songza which will allow users to enjoy an ad-free experience and uh, the, the subscription is uh, pegged at about $4.33 per month when you count a 52 uh, week year uh, which is uh, uh, just a little bit I think more expensive than uh, Pandora the Pandora One subscription which I think is a $3.99 uh, and uh, uh, per month uh, and it's certainly more within the reach of people than the 9.99 which is charged by uh, most uh, uh, digital subscription services for uh, mobile access of on-demand uh, streaming music so uh, this is an interesting development of course uh, using a weekly charge instead of a monthly one uh, makes it seem cheaper um, for a lot of users and and uh, more manageable because they can unsubscribe at any time and so uh, and the other interesting point was that they said that they are focusing on very interactive uh, uh, a few second interactions with sponsors uh, uh, that are encouraged with the users uh, are going to be encouraged with the users uh, uh, which are going to happen at the beginning of the playlist and these uh, interactive uh, sponsorship uh, things adverts are going to hopefully and potentially uh, for for songs's perspective uh, grant users a 24 hour ad free period after they interact with the advert so this is a very interesting proposition and i would love to see the price point uh, which songs uh, values those few second interactions in terms of advertising revenues and how those balance out when you look at 24 hours uh, worth of uh, music and the fees that come with it because we all know that um, i think uh, the, the numbers that were coming out is that pandora pays around uh, zero point uh, uh, 12 or so a cents per track that is played on the service so uh, all very interesting stuff uh, and uh, um, uh, I just want to ask you guys uh, in terms of the consumption we didn't talk about uh, radio at all uh, is radio a big thing or internet radio is is it a big thing in in, in Japan and do you think it's, it's gonna grow uh, oh um, we have a digital well, Radico is not exactly internet radio in a sense of Pandora. Yeah, uh, it's just like a, an aggregated form of internet radio, uh, which is like traditional inter- uh, radio. So uh, to to say we have something that's Pandora or Sangza, well, Sangza not really, but uh, Pandora equivalent is we don't at all at this point. Yeah. Uh, we ha- something similar started called Farao which is uh, a service created by a company called Faith. Yeah. Um, I'm not so popular yet, I, I believe. Um, going back to Songza, I just want to say for the record that I love Songza. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love it. And uh, uh, I will gladly pay, and I'm happy that they finally sent out the invitation for my club, club Songza, first of all. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I, I, I uh, VPN yeah. it at times. Yeah. <laughs> I turn on my VPN just to use Songza. <laughs> I will admit to that. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it's brilliant. It's definitely fresh. Yeah. yeah. 
definitely. Uh, Stephen, uh, on your side, uh, any 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 thoughts about radio in general and uh, and uh, internet radio in particular? Well, as I agree with Taisha. Internet radio is very much in its infancy here in Japan for many of the same reasons we've already talked about: uh, territoriality, conservatism, bureaucracy, uh, concern about copyright on the parts of rights holders. You know, lack of a um, you know a brand that really you know catches people's captures people on people's imaginations, and that reflects. Uh, to some extent, um, the overall radio market here, which is in really bad shape, yeah. um, radio has never been, I could go on about this, radio has never been as important a medium in Japan as it has been in other parts of the world for some for one really basic, simple reason, commuting patterns. People don't drive to work here as much. Um, they don't listen to the radio. People in North America and Europe, especially North America, um, you can tell I'm a Canadian. I say North America. Um, <laughs> go go to, to and from work a lot in their cars. What do they do in their cars? They listen to the radio here. Um, they're reading. Although I'm noticing everybody using their smartphones on the trains now. But they're not, they're listening to music on their smartphones, but mainly they're texting. Yeah. Um, you know. So uh, radio. Uh, here's here's a stat for you. This will just blow people's minds. Here's Tokyo, biggest city in the world. Technically, uh, what is it? Close to 12 million people or something, and there are four FM radio stations in this market. <laughs> one, one of four. That's four, folks. One of which is NHK, which is not commercial. You know, Japan Broadcasting Corporation. The other three are Tokyo FM, Inter FM, um, and um, what's it? What it? Uh, J Wave, right? So wow. yeah. Uh, and they don't, and uh, you know, they're not making huge amounts of money. Advertising has deserted radio. <laughs> Advertising is deserting television, but more so radio. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> it's it's sad because I like radio. So the whole idea, the radio paradigm here, um, just doesn't excite people. I think yeah. Taishi can disagree with mm. me if he, he wants no, to, but no. you know, you know what I mean. It's 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 because it used to be like I mean it's before my time even, but in the, like the seventies when FM radio was. Yeah introduced here you had like air check magazines people going oh wow i'm gonna you know like train spotting kind of stuff i'm gonna log which song was played at what hour on fm radio well that's a long time ago <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore so my son my son is 19 years old does he listen to the radio no forget nope. about it it's yeah. it's so it's sad right well i think we're gonna uh, i'm gonna bring the show to a close uh, uh, just a couple more service announcements. Of course, there's more news coming from Pandora. Uh, you know, they cut a deal with the UMPG on direct licensing, but it's only a short-term one until the end of the year. There's a lot of stuff pending with Pandora, and there's uh, so much to talk about. But I think we'll defer that to next week because we had we've been covering Pandora quite a bit in the last uh, two episodes anyway. So uh, um, I think it's good to take a week's break and uh, reassess uh, and revalue what, what happens uh, going into next week. And uh, also a couple of service announcements. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the documentary uh, Napster on, on Napster called Downloaded. Uh, it's been available mm -hmm. from the 1st of July uh, in the US. Uh, only as far as I'm aware in terms of digital download. You can download it from pretty much anywhere in the US, but it's not available anywhere else. So uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people bit torrenting, uh, torrenting that uh, uh, that uh, uh, movie uh, and uh, I I'm good so I'm just going to wait but I, I missed it at South by Southwest in March and uh, so I haven't seen it yet uh, but it, it could be a good movie to sum up uh, some of the Napster story um, as, as it happened and, and the uh, congressional hearings about that as well and talking about South by Southwest uh, the other service announcement is that the South by Southwest machine is uh, starting to get back into gear after three months of uh, quiet uh, you know it's, uh, the, it seems like South by Southwest uh, goes all year round really because from uh, sort of June until March it's it's uh, you know 24/7, and uh, um, uh, so it's important to note that from August 1st you're going to be able to buy your pass uh, for the interactive film and music conference, uh, and if you're planning planning to submit a panel proposal, you better get to work as well because the deadline is uh, you know the, the submissions I have already opened on the South by panel picker, and uh, the deadline is the 26th of July. They usually extend it by a few days towards the end of the month, but I wouldn't count on it, so I would submitted before the 26th of July if you have a good idea for a panel and uh, so you know that's all on South by and that's all for the show uh, thanks so much guys for coming on I would uh, again I would direct people to your websites uh, just 
to make sure that uh, they know where to find you. So Taishi, for you, it's uh, enter.prtl.jp. And if people are interested in the US, Europe, or anywhere else in the world, really, uh, to uh, bring their startup or their company into Japan, uh, I could, uh, uh, especially from a technology standpoint, I couldn't uh, recommend a better person. So uh, anything else uh, on your end that you want to uh, plug? Uh, no, that's about it. Thank that's you. That's about it. Great. Awesome. And uh, Steven, uh, again, another uh, great person to be in touch with if you are looking at uh, being or entering the Japanese music market uh, as, uh, uh, you know, in all sorts of ways. And uh, you can find uh, information on uh, what he does and his blog on uh, MecklerMusic.com and also subscribe to his new newsletter. Uh, Steve, anything else you need to plug uh, at, at this point or anything you're working on that you want to talk about? Um, not really. Um, uh, it's been great talking to you guys. And, uh, you know, I have a really, really important appointment ahead of me. I got to get out of here and Absolutely. drink beer. That's I have great. to drink beer because it's, it's hot. It's summer. You know, here I know also. it's, it's, it's beer o'clock for you. It's one o'clock in the morning for Taishi. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And it's nine o'clock in the morning for me. So I think uh, we better call it a day and let Taishi go yeah. to sleep and uh, you can go and have a well deserved beer. Well, thanks so much, yes. you guys, for your time. And thanks Thank for you. listening. Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of channels, as I mentioned. The YouTube, SoundCloud, the MixCloud, uh, iTunes, of course, especially, and most podcatchers. And you can also catch the DMT one to one show where I interview individual startups and digital music marketing projects uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.